Welcome to another episode of Angels, Positivity, and Love. Incredible guests from the world over with insights and amazing advice. They've often been through some sort of transformative journey themselves, and they're today giving service to others. We've had all sorts of wonderful guests from all walks of life from about 25 countries come on the show. We've had a White House physician to the U.S. president, the youngest Delta Force operator ever to be admitted, uh, come on the show, healers of all different types, a Super Soul Sunday show guest with Oprah, a Super Soul Sunday 100 teacher, uh, and also doctor, psychiatrist, uh, an actor from Australia. You know him from Amazon Prime if you've checked out Sea Patrol, Captain Mike Flynn. Definitely watch that series. He's a fantastic fellow. Uh, and so today, uh, not breaking this pattern in the slightest, we have Robert Baer coming to us from Oregon. Fantastic background, fantastic story. He's been featured on TV, The Unexplained with William Shatner, History Channel, um, other shows like that. He's popular in Asia right now, getting even more popular in Latin America. Let me give you just a touch of his background. He's had two near-death experiences. I believe they were on the same day. One was for 45 minutes. He's going to correct all this if I got anything wrong. But he was for a long time in law enforcement, California, highway patrol, other jurisdictions, other states, West Coast, I think mainly. He's co-founder today and vice president of Spiritual Awakenings International in Toronto, along with Dr. Yvonne Quezon, who's already been a guest once, will be a guest again. She's fantastic, had five near-death experiences as a physician. Um, and I'll leave it at that. He's uh, absolutely just got a wonderful presence that you are very shortly going to get to experience. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me uh, as a guest, and it's an honor to speak to your audience. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Uh, can you share with us a little bit about uh, before the near-death experience you had in Arizona, you were boarding a plane, putting the luggage up, and you knew something wasn't right going into this, and a lot happened. We'll get to that. Everybody asks you about that. But your life up until that point, it wasn't a bad life in any way. What was this all about? Well, I, I, um, I came from a background where, uh, you and you touched on it, where I'd been a policeman for 23 years, and um, I worked for the California Highway Patrol, and before that, the Santa Cruz uh, City Police Department, which is in California. And um, my life had been pretty much a, a rigid black and white type existence. And that's just the way it was. Uh, I wasn't spiritual in any way, shape, or form. Um, just the facts. That's all that I worried about. And um, when I retired from police work, I did a, a variety of different things. I was a university professor, uh, ran six programs uh, at, at, at the university level, was headhunted, became a community manager, excuse me, a city manager. I also uh, was the tribal administrator of, a, of, of a Native American uh, nation. Um, and, a, and an international business consultant. I did a variety of these things, but the one thing that I, that I had in common with all this, I had a lot of power. And uh, I honestly did not realize the effect that the power that I had had with other people when I dealt with them. And um, that's how I want to start this. Um, and I was born March 21st, 1948, in Santa Cruz, California, and I died on March 22nd, 2009, in Phoenix, Arizona. That was my life. And the events that led up to this were actually things that I should have been paying more attention to, but I didn't. And it all started with a telephone call I had with a police colleague that um, we had been policemen together since the 60s. And you always know you have a good friend when you pick up the phone and you haven't talked to him or her for a while. And then the conversation just seems to carry on. We were very close friends. And he was talking to me one night. And from out of the blue, he said, Robert, I have to ask you a question. And I said, well, go ahead, ask me. And he says, I don't know why I'm saying this, but are you okay with the Lord? Are you right with the Lord? 
And I, I thought, well, I, I think so. And then we just continued to talk. Um, a short time after that, I was in bed and my mother had passed away in 2005. And this was now 2008, the end of 2008. And I woke up and there was my mother at the foot of my bed. She was absolutely beautiful. She looked like she did when I was a little boy, young. And she passed away when she was 79 years old. So I, re I recognized her right off. She was right there. And she started to talk to me. And I don't know how she did it. I think it was telepathic. But she told me that I needed to get my affairs in order and that I was going to die. And it seemed like a dream, but it wasn't a dream. And she just disappeared. And I was so angry at myself because I had her right in front of me. And I should have been thinking and told her how much I loved her and how much I missed her. And I missed that opportunity. And my father was still alive at the time. And I, I called him. Well, first of all, I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. It, I was done. Uh, I called my father in the morning and I told him about what had happened. Of course, he wanted to know if she asked about him. And I said, no, this is exactly what she said. And I didn't think much more about it. it but then my friend that it, I'd had the phone call with, my old police friend, he passed away. He died. And I went down to uh, to uh, California for his celebration of life and actually participated in it. I probably was the person that had known him the longest. And I spoke and uh, met his family. And um, it was a shocker that he passed. And um, I made it back to Oregon. Continued with life. And then. A short time later, this was around the beginning of 2009, he shows up at the foot of my bed. And he looked like we did, like he did when we were young. Young, vivacious. He was all in, both my mother and him were in, like they were all white, white clothing. And, and I saw him and I, and he said, I have a message for you. And again, I don't know how he talked to me. I think it was telepathically. He says, I'm going to bring you through the light. And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, I have to go. I want to visit my grandchildren in Sacramento. Well, that, that it did, did it for me the rest of the night. I mean, I was in a pool of sweat. I couldn't go back to sleep, but I made some calls and I found out his grandchildren did live in Sacramento. So that, that verified that. And I had a full physical right after that. It was my annual thing where you have the treadmill and you have the blood tests and urine tests. And well, I passed out with flying colors. So in the back of my mind, I kind of put everything to rest. But I went to Arizona in uh, spring of back March of 2009. And uh, my son had been a high school uh, teacher and uh, coach. And he had a spring break. And I used to like to go to Arizona and visit him and his family. And we would go at that time of year, we would go to the spring training games. And it was a lot of fun. I got to spend time with my granddaughters and um that week that I was there, the temperature was just miserable. It was hot. And I'm from a coastal climate. I'm from Oregon, right on the coast. I live, in fact, my place is actually on the beach. I'm used to that fog and cool weather. And I just didn't feel good the whole time I was there. And I just kind of racked it up to the fact that I was in this heat. But... When it came time to get on a plane to go home, I thought, man, I, I can hardly wait to get back to Oregon. So 
he took me to the airport. My son did. We said our goodbyes. And I saw this long TSA line. I thought, how am I going to do this? Because I wasn't feeling well. But I did. I made it through. Went to a little convenience market that they had in the terminal. Bought some aspirins. Probably a good thing I did. Took them. And um, I just waited in the boarding area to get on the plane. And they finally called uh, the plane for our flight. And I, by myself, I got on the plane. And as I was putting things in the overhead bin, I dropped dead from a massive heart attack. And I have to tell you, I don't remember anything about my body from that point on. As far as I know, there were two firemen from the Pacific Northwest that were on the plane and a doctor. And I was told they gave me CPR and uh, used a defibrillator on me. But I wasn't there. I was gravitating into a light. And I was being accompanied. And I'd like, I don't know who was with me, but I'd like to think it was my friend because if he told me he would do something, he would do it. But I went up in this light and it was absolutely beautiful. I saw colors that don't exist on this on this earth. And it was warm and just wonderful. And we we were going up and all of a sudden I ended up in the presence of a higher power. And it was the most humbling thing you could ever imagine. I could not even look at the higher power. I knew the higher power was there. I could not look. And around me, were, it was like an auditorium, but it wasn't. There were, there were souls. I knew they were souls all over the place. And then it began. I was spoken to. And I don't know if it was telepathic. I don't know exactly what happened. I don't know what language it was, but I was asked what good I had done in my life. And the next thing I knew on my left started a life review of my life from the time I was conceived until the time that I died. And I relived every event of my life and I experienced all the emotions that I had gone through but what was different about this was that I experienced what other people thought of me and what they were feeling. And it was a reckoning for me. When you have all the power that I had in my life, whether you arrest somebody or you, you fail them in their, uh, as a professor or you fire them as a, as a manager, the effect you have on people, it just doesn't, end with that. I mean, it just keeps going on and on. And I saw myself. <clears throat> I mean, I had a stuttering problem when I was a, a young child. And I saw my grandmother, who took uh, just a wonderful, I had two wonderful grandmothers. My grandfathers have, had died before I was born. But one of my grandmothers took it on herself to help me with my stuttering problem. And I would go spend time with her, and she would get me to slow down and uh, would tell me stories. She saw Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. This tells you how old she was and, and how long ago. I'm 70. I'm, I'm almost 77 years old, so that tells you how long ago this was. And I, I would listen to her, and 10 minutes later, I'd ask her the same question to tell me about it. She, she said, Robert, I just told you about this, but then she'd tell me very patient, very loving. And we would listen to a radio. Uh, she didn't have a television. And it, this was like around 1952 or something like that. And I remember listening to the radio and then she had just a bed. I would lay down in bed with her and I could smell her and hear her snore. And when I saw this part of my life review, it all was there the snoring, the smell. I miss my grandmother so much. And I saw all these things in my life take place. And I was a pretty good athlete, <clears throat> extremely good in basketball and, and baseball. And as a freshman, 
I made the varsity baseball team, which was rare because they had a JV and they had a varsity team. And I actually started in right field. And I know I started in right field because I had a strong arm. And some of the other players kind of bullied me on the team. And one was a senior, and I was in the shower. I'm bringing this up for a reason, because I'm going to talk about karma shortly. But I was in the, in the, in the shower, and the men's locker room was one side of a swimming pool. There was a swimming pool that separated that from the girls' locker room. And there was the swim team. The girls' swim team was actually practicing at the time I was in the shower. Well, this guy uh, took me out of the shower, threw me out naked, out where all the girls were practicing their swimming, locked the door, and I was pounding on the door. And the swim coach came over, and she gave me a towel and helped me get back into the into the locker room. And um, it's just one thing that I went through. I saw these emotions, and <laughs> it wasn't fun to see some of those things. But also, people in my age, cars were a big thing. Um, we had auto lab in school, and you could work on your car uh, while you were in high school. It was part of the curriculum. And we used to bring in our cars, and we'd all work on each other's cars. And, and in fact, I rebuilt an engine for my uh, – we rebuilt an engine for one of my – father's trucks and uh, did stuff like that. And uh, on the weekends, I used to like cruising, go cruising with my friends. And our favorite place was Beach Street in Santa Cruz. And I had a sister that was about 11 months younger than me, 10, 11 months younger than me. My father always referred to her as my Irish twin. Um, and I came and grew up in an Irish Catholic household. Um, she could not go out on a date unless I was on there. And she had to sit in the front seat with her boyfriend, and I got to sit in the back seat. That's just the way it was. And you didn't question my mother or father. That's just what happened. And I would always ask this one lady to, that was in a, a grade below me to go with me, and she would always go with me. And... One day I was working on my car and she came over to my place and she said, there's a dance at the Coconut Grove tonight. And she said, can you take me to the dance? And I looked at her and I said, um, I had other plans. And she says, well, can you break the plans? And I said, my friends and I, I said, we're going to go cruising. Um, I'll be down on Beach Street. And she goes, well, can I go cruising with you? And I said, we don't, we don't want any girls. Uh, and we used to do that. And then we'd go, we'd find somebody to drag race, and we'd go up north of town, and we'd drag race up north of town. This is what, in that time period, this is what teenagers did. And, um, and I'm so glad I lived in that time period and experienced this. But she got upset at me. And um, she came back, and she threw this letter at me. It was in an envelope, sealed in an envelope. And I said, what's this? And she says, read it. She took off. Well, that night, she went with some other friends and was involved in a car accident, and she died in the car accident. And... When I saw this part of my life review, I heard a voice say, you never opened my letter. It had to be her. Mm -hmm. I still have that letter. It's in storage. I've never opened it. But it, I kept it. And it was, a, it was an eye-opener for me. And... I saw myself progress in my life. It was really, it was really, un <laughs> it was really strange to see all the things that ha that happened in my life and how I became a policeman. 
people would have never believed it because I, I was not someone that was you would ever think would be a policeman, but I became one, and I did it at the earliest age possible, twenty one, and I saw myself in all these police type situations, and how when I interacted people how they how they felt, and um, I went to a. Uh, I got picked up by the California Highway Patrol, was offered a job, went to Sacramento, ended up <clears throat> like second in my class, was uh, assigned to the Watts area, South Los Angeles, South Central Los Angeles, right after the riots or during the riots. And I was stationed down there. And it might have been, it might as well have been a war zone. It was not unusual at night to hear gunshots going off. And being a blonde-haired, blue-eyed policeman was not a good thing down there, but I did it. And we would make uh, stops on people. They, they doubled us up. We would make stops on, on people, and they'd take us, like, into the uh, uh, alleyway between two apartment complexes. And it would not be unusual to be writing a ticket or talking to somebody and there'd be a rifle pointing at you. It was not unusual. It was like a war zone. It wasn't a war zone, but it was like it. And um, a lot of hatred, a lot of bitterness. I didn't realize it. And one night I was with another officer and we were arresting somebody that for just, just for DUI and getting ready to put him in the, uh, in the back seat of the patrol car and some gunshots went off. And even the violator said, those sound like they're pretty close. So we got him in and lo and behold, I saw this guy running at me with a rifle and I yelled at him to freeze. He didn't. I didn't draw down on him. I don't know why I didn't. It was my sixth sense, I guess. He came up and he told us that somebody had just robbed him and uh, he fired off some warning shots. And when I saw that part of my life review, I actually heard a voice say, thank you for not shooting me. That had to be that man. All the things that happened in my life, the good times, the bad times, the birth of children, um, anybody that's been through a divorce, some of those are pretty ugly. The biggest problem I have to deal with, even now coming back, is betrayal. Because when you have your life review like I had, there's no secrets. There's nothing but the truth. And betrayal is just really hard to deal with and I have an ex-wife who remarried and we have a daughter that uh, she's an attorney now but uh, she uh, had some health issues and was going through uh, some surgeries life-threatening surgery and I went up to where she's from and her mother was up from where she's from and uh, we were in the surgery waiting room. We hadn't talked together or talked in years. I avoided any uh, any time she had a you know a holiday thing with my daughter. I wouldn't go, and she would avoid me. It was one of those things. Um, it was a highly contested, ugly divorce, and. Um, I was in the waiting room with her and and I told her, I said, this was after I came back to life. I told her, I said, you know, we have a daughter that may not make it. And <clears throat> she may need both of us. <clears throat> and uh, her mom and her dad. And I said, let's just bury the hatchet. Um, let's just... That old Beatles song, let it be, just let it be. And we made an agreement that day. And as I was leaving the hospital, 
I said, can you just answer one question for me? And I said, I'll never bring it up again. Just something that I said, you know that I died uh, and was revived. And I talked about a bet betrayal situation involving her because I had seen it play out. And she said, that's exactly what happened. It's nothing but the truth. And I kept seeing all these things that happened in my career. I was a watch commander one night. And there was a, a car that had gone over the embankment and, and hit a tree and was on fire. And uh, there was somebody in the car that uh, had burned to death. And so I went up there with a camera, take pictures. And we got the car up uh, with, a, with a tow truck. The guy was laying across the seat like this with his arms like that, like he was holding his chest. And I told the other, the other officers were there. I, well, I asked him, I said, have you ever seen someone burned to death that there wasn't in the field position? And we all just scratched our head and said, no. And I said, I don't know if this guy was died in an accident. This might have been a murder or something or a homicide. So I called the uh, the other uh, the, the sheriff's office. They, they came up and we got, uh, their commander said, no, that's not a well, this is a traffic accident. So I said, OK, we'll 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 take the report on it. And the coroner was up there and and. Um, the young man who was deceased lived in an area not too far from there but it was a wooded area and i was i was asked if i would go uh tell his next to kin what had happened and i i never liked to do that but i did it and um but by the way just to let you know they found slugs in the man's chest when they did the autopsy we were right but anyways i uh, I drove up the, this driveway. It was uh, like a, a dirt road that led up to a, a, a really nice house. And as I drove up, I saw the lights come on in the house. And I got out of my patrol car and started to walk up. And I heard this woman screaming. And I thought, oh, boy. Got up and knocked on the door. And she opened the door and, and she said, you're here to talk to me about my son. I said, well, I'm not going to lie to you. And I said, is there anybody here with you? And she goes, no, there's not. So I said, well, can we sit down and talk? And we did. And I, I told her what I knew had happened. And I told her, I said, do you have somebody I can call to maybe be with you at this time and and she goes no and when i was seeing this part i heard a voice say thank you for being so nice to my mother that had to be that young man's voice and um i just kept seeing stuff like that over and over again each career that i had um one of the last shifts that I had on the highway patrol, I was working one night and it was after two o'clock in the morning. I decided to get out and drive around a little bit. And I was trying to get caught up on all my paperwork because I knew I was going to be leaving. And I thought, well, I'm going to take another, another drive. Get out and I started going down the coast highway. This was in the Santa Cruz area. And by the way, I'd worked in South Central Los Angeles, East Los Angeles, Oakland twice, San Francisco twice, Santa Cruz twice. Might have missed one. Uh, so I had been in some pretty big areas. 
And so a lot of crap happened. Uh, it wasn't, um, it was busy. And I have all these things I experienced. But I was in Santa Cruz and I decided to take a drive. So I'm I'm driving down the coast highway and I see this Thunderbird driving all over the road. And I thought, oh, this guy's got to be drunk. It's the right time in the morning. It's 2.30 in the morning or something like that. So I called uh, an adjacent beat unit to come and help me because they didn't want the watch commander or the shift supervisor tied up uh, in the jail uh, because uh, something may happen and where you have to respond. So I told everybody I was going to make, make a stop on this guy because I was afraid he'd get in a wreck by the time he, they, they were there to back me up. So I pulled him over, walked up to the car and he rolled down the window and I asked him for his driver's license and registration and he gave me his license and I looked at it. All of a sudden I realized that was the guy that threw me out in uh, the swimming pool area when I was playing baseball. When I said I was going to talk about karma, I believe in karma. Holy cow, here he was. And I thought, Thank you, Jesus. It was just like uh, it was, here he was. And the Jason Beat unit came up, and I never told him who I was. He kept saying I looked familiar, but I never said nothing. But I told the officers, so I'm going to take this one myself. And uh, put him in my patrol car and drove him to jail and listened to him cry about you know how his life was going to be ruined, and his wife was going to leave him, and everything. <clears throat> and it was just like, it was just like karma. I mean, here he was, this guy that was the bully. He bullied me in high school. Here he was, and um, never told him who I was. Did what I had to do. Booked him. Um, went to court. The Said he pleaded guilty before uh, be, for to to a lesser uh, charge. By the time I got there, so we never talked to one another. But it felt good. I have to admit that was at the time that I I done that. I thought I can't believe that this is happening, but it happened. But anyways, and I I like to tell your audience. You know, we're we're in a time in life where people use their cell phones and they take pictures and they take videos. And we're used to seeing all these things uh, as, they're, as they happen live. Where I went, there's no videos. There's no pictures. I might as well be like Marco Polo or Christopher Columbus. Or even Mark Twain, who used to go off on adventures and they'd come back. Like Marco Polo would talk to the queen and he'd bring the, the pasta he, fa he found in uh, Asia. And that created the big spaghetti phenomena and all that other stuff. And, and would talk about what he saw. The same thing with Columbus. To their queens and kings. And they had no pictures. No videos. It was their word. And what you have from me is my, my word to the best of my ability, what I can recall. And um, I just want your audience to be aware of that. And I'm saying this for a reason. Because when you look at near-death experience type things, there can be more than one type. And as I was going through my life review, I brought this up for a, for a minute. As I was going through my life review, something was fidgeting off on the right. I could never look at the higher power, but I looked to the right, and my dog Scooter that died in 2001 was right there. And she was so excited. She couldn't come to me, and I don't know why, but she couldn't. 
but she was there and I kept looking at my life review and I'd look over at her, look at my life review, look over. I did not know that animals were in that realm. And I don't know how, but I ended up back in my body and I was in an emergency room in a hospital. And when I saw myself, I had actually died again. And I gravitated above the bed. I'd seen the flat line on the screen. I saw the doctors frantically working. And I was so blessed. I had a doctor from Pakistan who just wouldn't let me die. He was just a great guy. And uh, I was watching him work on me. And all of a sudden, in another part of the hospital, in another room, I saw a couple of people going through my belongings, which came in the, it came in with the ambulance. And I, I stopped paying attention to them working on me. And I went, I focused on what they were doing and with my stuff. And they were going through everything. And a lot of policemen, we carry two wallets. One has your badge and your ID in it. The other one has your stuff like your social security card. And uh, maybe you got pictures in there, your, kids or whatever, um, and probably money. They were going through my wallet trying to find my insurance card because they were talking about it. I was saying, well, this, this guy must have insurance card somewhere. And I was trying to tell them where they were because they were actually behind my police ID and my police um, wallet. I tried to tell them where it was. They couldn't hear me, and I thought, I must be dead. And all of a sudden... They opened my police wallet and said, oh, man, this guy's retired police. And I heard them talking about it. And the next thing I know, I was back to life in the emergency, in the emergency room on that gurney. Then came the long process of rehab. I was up in an ICU uh, unit, hooked up to all these machines. It was horrible. I had a, like a flailed chest. I uh, couldn't breathe real well. I wanted to, I was, my big goal was to stay around till both my children could see me. And that was actually my goal because my daughter had to fly uh, in to see me. And the doctor kept, kept coming in and he, he kept talking to me and He asked me, he said, do you remember anything from when you were dead? And I said, because I knew I had died. I was told that, but I also knew because I saw them going through my stuff. I knew something had happened like that. And he said I'd been, first time I'd been dead for quite a while. And, um, and the second time for about 10 minutes. So I said, yeah, I said, I remember quite a bit. And I, and I told him about the experience in the hospital. Well, he went and he got the people that were working in the admissions and brought them to my bedside and said, Robert, tell me what you told me. And I told them and they both looked at each other and they looked at the doctor and they said, that's exactly what happened, word for word. So it validated everybody that was there. And I'm saying this for a reason, because on the same day, I died twice. I had two different types of near-death experiences. One that had a life review, where I gravitated into this light. Another one where I was just on over the bed watching them work on me. So if you watch some of these videos about Maybe on this channel, for example, about near-death experiences, they might not all be the same. And I experienced two different ones on the same day. And I had a long recovery. I kept telling the doctor I wanted to go back home to, to Oregon. I'd seen my daughter, seen my son. Uh, 
I said, I, I, I want to go home. And he says, you need one more surgery. <clears throat> and I said, just put me on a plane. I'm fine. And he says, well, I'll put you on a plane if you promise me that when you get to Oregon, you will have the surgery done. He said, I actually have a colleague, uh, someone that I know in Eugene, that could do this in Oregon. And I said, I promise. So I'll tell you what, I went on that flight. I didn't know if I was going to make it, but I went ahead and did it. And I had my cell phone. I even got a call from the doctor's office saying, did you make it? <laughs> yeah, I made it. And then it's, you know, you got, you got to check in. Uh, they, I said, I will. So I actually went in to have the, have another surgery. And I had that surgery. And when I was all finished with it, they had me in this recovery room. And in Oregon, this isn't unusual, but it was raining heavy outside and the wind was blowing and you could, you could hear the wind blowing and you could hear the rain against the window pane. And I'm laying in this recovery room and all of a sudden I look over to the left and here's this nun. And I thought to myself, hmm. And I said, am I dead? And she goes, no, you're not dead. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And I was half, and she goes, I'm praying for you. And I said, well, thank you for praying for me. And and, and uh, she started to talk a little bit. And, and I said, well, how long have I been in here? And she says, well, I've been here for quite a while. And she says, I have a question to ask you. And I said, okay. And she said, I understand you were deceased for a long time. And I said, well, who told you that? And she goes, it's all over the hospital. It's like you're Lazarus or something like that. <laughs> I said, well, okay. And she said, I've been a sister or I've been a nun my whole adult life. And do you remember anything that happened when you were deceased? And I said, I do. And she said, could you share that with me? I just, and she'd known that I'd gone, even though I went to the University of San Francisco, which is a, which is a, um, it's a Jesuit school too. I mean, that, that's my life. And she kind of put the, pressure on me <laughs> I felt like I was putting my hand out getting slapped in the hand with a ruler again but it wasn't but I said yeah but I said does it have to be now and she said I've, she said, I'll come back so she came back and um, she's one of two people that I told everything to and I decided I've been writing a book It'd probably be done pretty soon. But that's how I started the book. Being in that recovery room with the nun and telling her all the things that had happened. And that's going to be the crux of my story. My life story with these near-death experiences. Um, and um, it was... I mean, I, I don't know how people found out about all these. I, I had people calling me about shows, and um, I had one call to do a show called I Survived Beyond a Back, and I didn't even want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk about this to my friends. They would think I'm crazy about all the things I experienced. And I thought, well, maybe I am crazy, but I knew I wasn't. But... Um, took a lot to get me to start talking and um, the show called me up and said, you know, can you come to New York and tape the show? And I said, what date do you have in mind? And they told me, and I said, no. And they said, well, why not? And I said, I can't do it. 
So they called me back. And in fact, I told them I didn't want to go to New York. So they called me back and said, well, we're going to be in Washington, D.C. Would you fly? I said, no, I don't want to go to Washington, D.C. They wanted me really bad. I could tell. And I was trying not to talk. But they, they called me and said, we're going to be in Los Angeles. Can you catch a flight there? And I said, I don't really want to fly. And they said, well, why not? I said, because I died in an airplane. They go, oh, we didn't know that. And I said, I have this phobia about being in an airplane right now. And it was rough for me to get in a plane to go back to Oregon, I'm telling you. And, and they said, well, can we interview you? And I said, well, you can come to Oregon. And they said, well, do you ever go anywhere where maybe they have a television station or something? I said, I'll be going to the Bay Area to see my father. And I am going to drive there. And I said, okay, well, can we book you? And I said, fine. And I all the way down, I thought, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing or not. Uh, I could just see people thinking, oh, I'm crazy and everything. And, but I got on YouTube and I was watching a sports recap. And on the sidebar, they have all these different types of things that might interest you. And I saw this thing that said George Harrison's last interview. And I thought to myself, I saw the last Beatles concert, Candlestick Park in 1966. I love the Beatles. So I thought, I'm going to click on that. So I clicked on that. And here was George Harrison, his last interview. And if your audience wants to hear something, all you got to do is listen to the first five or six minutes. He talks about fame, fortune, being able to have anything you wanted in life, all these different things, women, everything, wealth. And he should have been worrying about what's going to happen to him when he died. And I listened to that. And I was driving in my car and I never listen to talk shows or anything that have to do with anything, um, you know, that d deal with NDEs or anything like that. And I was driving in Oregon one night and couldn't get anything else on the AM. It was just in a secluded area, but there was one station that came in. So I turned on it, uh, turned it on, and it was George Norrie's Coast to Coast show. And he, it happened to be about what happens to you when you die. And I listened to his panel of these educated people that, and I'm educated myself, but that gave their theories on what happens when you die. And I thought, that's not what happens when you die. <laughs> and then this show came about this. I survived beyond the back. So I thought maybe I'm supposed to talk. So I did it not having any idea what would come of it. And I even met the producer afterwards. We had a bite to eat afterwards. And I asked her, you heard me talk. Has anybody given an account like I just gave? And she said, you'd be surprised. She had told me that she had not been a believer, but interviewing all the all the people changed your whole outlook in life. And when I heard that, I thought, well, maybe it'll be okay. Didn't tell anybody about it. Absolutely nobody. And I had to go down to Arizona where my son lives, so uh, he wanted to have a vehicle that I had uh, for his business. He, so I said, okay, I'll drive down there. So I started to drive on Interstate 5, which is the road that goes right down um, 
interstates between um, Washington all the way down to California. And I'm in California, and I stopped in this truck stop and um, got gas and wanted to use the restroom. So I'm walking down this hall, and there's this little doorway that's open, and I see a bunch of people in there. This was on a Sunday, and I thought, well, whatever. So uh, they all smiled at me, and um, I go into the rest restroom, and pretty soon this guy comes in there, and he goes, you're the guy that's on the TV show. And I said, really? <laughs> he goes, yeah, we just we were just talking about you. Because we, your show was on the TV, and you're the guy that saw your dog, and and I said, well, and they said, hey, can you? We'd be honored if you come in and talk to us. And I thought, holy cow! I didn't even know it it had aired. I didn't even know that I'd made the. You know, I I didn't know anything about it. So <laughs> I walked in there. And all of a sudden, I realized that there is a spiritual awakening that's happening in this world. All these truck drivers asking all these questions. And um, I finally told them, I said, hey, I got to get to Arizona. <laughs> Have a good life. <laughs> and I left and I went down, hit I-10 and to cut across and when I lived in Los Angeles, I always used to go to this one in and out burger. And there wasn't any up north. And I thought my cardiologist would kill me. But I want a double-double with grilled onions. <laughs> so I pulled off and went into this in and out burger. It's off of Grand Avenue in Covina. And I saw a couple of police cars there. And I went up. Stood in line, getting ready to order my meal. And this nice police lady comes up to me and she goes, you're the guy that was just uh, interviewed on a TV show. The guy that was a policeman. And I looked at her and I said, well, that's the rumor. And she goes, could you, would you like to sit with us? And I said, sure. I said, let me get my, let me get my order. So I sat with them. And I realized there's a non-traditional religious faction in our society that is looking at the internet, not attending church like people in my age group did and before. Um, they see it on television. They see it on the internet. And for some reason or other, I had now become part of that uh, part of that faction. I wasn't expecting that at all, and my phone began blowing up. Can you speak here? Can you speak there? Can you do that? And and I just I don't know how it happened, but it happened, and I think it was divine intervention in some way, shape, or form, because uh, I did not want to speak, but I started to speak, and. Um, all over. I was traveling here, traveling there, um, conferences here, talking to groups. I even talked to a group of atheists. Uh, it was, I took on every assignment. I figured I'm just going to be honest, tell the truth what happened and what I remembered. Just like Marco Polo, just like Christopher Columbus, just like Mark Twain, and they can believe me or not, I really don't care. Just like that nun. I mean, and that's why I'm doing your show. And um, I want to thank you for what you're doing for society. I ended up talking in Arizona. I did four shows in two days, or four talks in two days. Um about five years ago, before COVID. And someone there was a board member for a group called IONS. And I have a corporate background too. And I was an international 
business consultant. So they had talked to me about, or he had talked to me about possibly applying for the board. There was an opening. So I said, okay. So I applied for it. I flew to Sarasota, Florida and was selected for the board. And I was there with a lady named Dr. Yvonne Kason. And <clears throat> she was going to run for president uh, the next term. And she called me and asked me to, if I'd want to run as a slate vice president. And I said, uh, well, let me think about it. And then by the time we finished talking, I said, okay, I'll do that with you. We ended up getting elected uh, president, vice president. But I was, believe it or not, I was in my shower and I get these downloads. I don't know how else to explain. It's like a download. And I had a download that that wasn't what I'm supposed to be doing. So I called Yvonne or I talked to her. I don't know if I called her. I just remember I talked to her. And I said, Yvonne, I don't know if this is what we're supposed to be doing. And she says, well, I said, I think we're supposed to be doing something else. But I knew that I was supposed to be doing it with her. That was, there was no, it was obvious. So a short time later, she had the same type of download. And we realized we wanted to be in an organization that encompassed all different types of spiritually transformative experiences, which might include Kundalini uh, type things or near, uh, not only near death experiences, but uh, uh, shared death and all these different types of things. And so we left IONS and, and formed Spiritual Awakenings International. There's a picture of Yvonne Kason. Yes. She's been, against, life, she I, mentions her I, half of not the same since I met that woman. <laughs> yeah. She mentioned the uh, other half of that story, how she got a download and knew you were the one she needed to partner up with. So people should check out that episode, episode, uh, episode 80 on Friday, June 21st. She's coming back on in 2025. Hopefully you will be as well. Uh, keep going. But, but, but anyways, we decided to put it together and I had a corporate background. So I, I was used to setting up corporations and stuff. We set it up and it's like a, and I, I mentioned, it's like a bullet train right now. We're in 98 countries, and this is like in four years. And we are all over the world. Um, and um, that's it, Spiritual Awakenings International. And you all we are kind to me after an interview. You've posted this show or listed it on your affiliate program list. And because we start with angels for angels, positivity, and love, we're about the sixth one down. It's just a resource for folks who are curious uh, without any particular partisan or any other type of, uh, it's a very neutral setup, just simply informational. But I think her and I started something wonderful for the world. And um, when you're in 98 countries and it's still growing. And now I, I, I mentioned to you, Michael, that Asia, which has been very hard to crack, I'm huge in Asia right now, and so you're gonna I, know make it. Got, I don't know how I got here, but I'm here. <laughs> you're going to make it big in Japan, was my joke before the show, referring to that 80s song, 1980s song, if anybody remembers that. Um, well, how about I blow you some lit sage? We'll wrap it up in a second, because we're having you back, and there'll be installments here. Uh, so we won't do too much, maybe three little baby steps, uh, but lighting sage is no big deal. If anyone's watched this show or me as a guest. Before uh, you start, oh, I yeah. want to thank I want to thank your audience for uh, listening, if, especially if you waited till the end, uh, <laughs> listening to this uh, presentation. And um, I feel honored to be uh, to make it in front of you. Thank you. Well, as I look at this, I'm, I'm saying I'm totally honored. I got your vibe. I was getting interviewed by the board for the whole show thing being listed on a website and more. I still owe a note to Yvonne. If you're seeing it and if I haven't written the note, oh my God, I'm bad. I got to write a thank you note. I think I've already said thank you though, but I need to do it again because you can't have too many thank you notes. Uh, but 
I'm blowing sage. I'm lighting sage. Anyone can catch sage. It doesn't matter if you're in Tokyo, um, Hanoi, Germany, and it's 2030. Time and space isn't what you think it is. It's just a little bit of love or consciousness or awareness. Catch some sage, but why settle for sage? Not that it's not great. Catch sage flowers. And if you even want a little bit of ocean or you figure something out, allow, ask, and receive seems to be the magic of the universe. And are you getting sage a-okay? Yay. I get to snub it out. I'll, I can. I'll put my hand up in Texas and you're in Oregon. Um, I'm not going to whole the whole way snub that out. Ah, it takes too much time. Okay. I'm just going to put my hand up in where my Texas, you're in Oregon. Feel the vibe. Only love and above. Not my bill paying, thinking, judging side. Whoops. Welcome to being human. Same thing for you. But anybody doing this, we're going to have angels, the universe, consciousness filtering this. So it's love and above for decades ahead. I'm feeling it. Are you feeling a little bit of vibration? Is it electricity, warmth? Yay. Uh, and then I was going to do one more thing this way, and then we're almost done. Uh, I'll do one angel maybe at the end, but I'm just going to whoosh light, rainbow light. It ain't me. We're blaming angels. Don't blame Canada. Lots of love, unconditional love, rainbow light. Um, we'll call it whooshing. We don't need to have any lingo. Okay, here it is. See if you feel it on your front, your back, or even catch light around you. One way or the other, there's a million ways for light to flow. Here it comes. And I'll blow through a microphone up there for a little Hawaii your way. Maybe Elvis will croon a song in the background. Here we go. And see if you just get a little extra sparkle, glitz. Let angels do their thing. You got that as well. We're dropping our hands now. Final act. And then we'll do uh, the gentlest quote in the world that I hold dear. It is the simplest compassion, kindness, gentlest quote. We'll get your reaction to that and do a final reminder for folks to walk a smoother path. But here's an angel named Joy. Even my dog is named after her. Um, she's an ambassador communicator. And if Big Mary, I think she said once, I don't remember much, but I remember this. She said, love is everywhere. Love is a constant. Open your eyes to find love. Meaning only a little bit of thinking something, anything can pull you out of the love, awareness, consciousness, being that is a, that is within you and around you and connects us all. Um, here's Joy. You can either put your hand out, feel her. You can ask for a hug. You can ask for a reminder from her to you. And you'll do our listening for us for a quick reminder. And then we're we're out. We're done. Minus that one last quote. Uh, you can smell flowers. There's a million ways to have joy interact. What are you getting in this moment? Ocean. Yes. Good enough. We're going to play more in the future. And we'll have you talk more in a more... Uh, What's it all about uh, sort of fashion, ins and outs of stuff. Uh, this is what you're going to be doing more of. Will be great. Uh, it'd be great to have you back on to do that. Here's the quote. I was about to hold it up. This is from an angel named Dale who might have coached an Olympic athlete we all know or helped an Olympic athlete we all know from the 70s, 80s. Um, but it wasn't. A, it was about that person following their unique life path and paying attention. Here's the quote. Sometimes the person next to you or a stranger just needs validation via love and compassion. A smile changes any moment. So too does laughter or a few kind words. Be compassionate to all, do it. What's your reaction to that and you're closing out this show? Phenomenal. Nothing but good vibes. I'm just so grateful that, I'm grateful you're in this universe, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it was incredible hearing the details. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time. Robert, so you've been on Angels Positivity and Love, but not for the last time, I hope. And uh, thank you to the audience. Please subscribe, like, share, put down some emojis. And also just what was I'm getting goosebumps. What was one of your favorite parts on this uh, throughout this show? Thank you again, Robert. Thank you.